Good evening. We've actually got three packages, but I'm just opening these two first. It's really quite unfortunate. You know, Amazon is advertising rings of power, but the problems I've heard of with it, it's pretty clear they kind of started as if they cared about the fundamental lore, but they just kind of threw it out the window. They and like a lot of people that do that, uh, I think that it sounds like the quality of the show suffered. Uh, but try not to take my um, talking about it as a gospel, just because, you know, I've not actually seen it. So it's just what I've heard, and it's unfortunate. Because it really does sound like they took something that's ridiculously expensive and then put people in charge of it who had no business being there. Oh well. So, um, I guess we'll begin with Vivi. There's something written in cursive underneath it that I'm having trouble reading because of just how much it's contrasting uh, here. I'm having trouble reading that first word. It's something eyes song. Uh, okay. So what can we discern from this first? Um, Japanese subtitles. So it does have a dub, it looks like. Singularity point. Ready? Hmm. Okay. Just getting a rough impression of what's in there. This was by the same person who did Voices of a Distant Star. I kind of wouldn't be surprised. It feels like it has the hallmarks of some of their work. But the color scheme is not what I'd normally think of. But that doesn't necessarily make it not theirs. And also, they've done more series than episodes, but... Curiosity. Four-Eyed Eyes song. Interesting. A very strange edition today. Next up, we have a Sayuki Gaiden on Blu ray, which I don't know if I already had on Blu ray, but you know, whatever. Let's see if we take a quick look at the back. I see it's region A only. Four episodes, English dub. I hope I read that right. My eyes have been kind of blurry today been one of those migraine days. It's not been a great day. And then we got Back Arrow. And I was kind of looking at her because for a while from a distance she was actually reminding me of um, Singer Girl from Mobile Suit Gundam Seed. While I was moving that, I wasn't looking at this, but... Interesting. What hides beyond the wall? Hmm. Curious. Regions A and B. We've got a English dub. I see a mecha there. Is this a mecha show? Looks like a lot of mechas. Interesting. So I guess a comparison to um, Gundam Seed might not have been completely inaccurate. Not knowing what it's about, hard to say for certain. Well, 
it was quick, but here's this week's anime DVD collection update. All right, um, let's start with um, Aho Girl. You know, it was one of the ones that I received last week that I was curious about. Because I remember, oh yeah, it looks like it's potentially funny and goofy. Sorry, I was just looking at the back and seeing uh, 1948. I'm like, I don't remember this being a 1948 or 2000, but I guess this is maybe a limited manufacturer. Hmm. Well, anyways, um, I kind of watched it, and the humor didn't quite rub me as much. It doesn't necessarily seem like it's as bad as maybe um, a lot of the comedies. Out there. I watched three episodes. I don't remember if I said that. Um, but it, it didn't grab me. And I'm trying to remember if I can think... If I, if I can remember why or analyze why that would be. Just for anybody who's also curious. Um, I suppose one of the problems I had with it was... It tried to set itself up in a way where... I felt it had to be believable, even though it wasn't. So, like, if it begins with um, our main two characters, um, Aho Girl um, gets all zeros on all of her exams. And I guess you would say that's midterms because it's multiple exams or something like that. Unless, well, it should be finals. But the problem there is that then it introduced the bickering between our main two characters, kind of as if nobody else has seen them bickering before. But at this point, they will have established that they've been at... This isn't like their first day at school or anything like that. They've both been there for a while, and it's just... Some people kind of act this way. And that, I think, did a lot to just make it where I didn't feel it as well. It felt like it had created arbitrary characters just to kind of have a jumping-off point. And I guess, I guess that's always, a, I think, a difficulty with writing. It's why there's all these writing tricks where it's like, okay, well, if you're going to have a world where everybody else is already established, but you need to introduce the audience to it, usually you use certain writing tricks like you do add a new character. Like, maybe that actually would have made this work if this started with somebody else coming to the school for the first time and them meeting these characters. But it felt like it was just this constant thing between the three episodes I watched where... It just felt in conflict, like it kind of took that for granted, or maybe it just never thought of it. And because of that, I guess it just didn't attach. I mean, I might be attributing um, some cause and effect sort of stuff, where it's not the problem wouldn't be that it um, that it was bad because it didn't do this. I mean, I'm not even saying it's bad. I would say it was less effective. Be not because it didn't do this, but because it didn't do that, that kind of suggests that the authors weren't in that right kind of meta space for me to um, find the humor appreciative and latching onto. There were funny things and comments made in there, but it, I didn't feel like I guess it was enough to keep me attached. Like, for example, I thought it was really amusing where, you know, she makes friends with these kids at the playground. And, you know, she's a high school girl, and they're going to be little itty-bitty kids. And the end of that first interaction is a kid saying, Wow, my parents are right. The economy really is hard. She's just not going to make it, is she? Or something like that, you know. They're like kids that have just been witness to not paying attention to things that your parents tell you to take to take advantage of. It's like they grew up 10 years that day just by happening to be there and observing her being out of girl. And that's kind of amusing. Um, and I could potentially watch more, but I think it's just that I'm juggling so much stuff that, you know, it's kind of a lower priority. So, it, it did make me gut-bustingly laugh. But, you know, still very interesting. Um, and then we got the whole laundry list of other stuff, so... Classroom of the Elite, Season 2, Episode 9. Uh, that stuff happens. It was more Classroom of the Elite goodness. Um, yeah, I don't know if I had more to comment about. Harem in the Labyrinth of Another World, Episode 11. Finally introduced another character to our main group. Um, 
and so far it's actually been kind of entertaining. Uh, and it's interesting because while I feel like um, Black Summoner always comes up in relation to this, because you know I've I've also watched episode eleven of that, and I forgot to update that in my notes, but those two are always in sync in terms of episode number. Um, one of the weaknesses of Black Summoner is it really does like to have characters praising our main character, but it sort of feels like they were just created for the purposes of doing that to a certain degree. Like, I, I know they do more with them, but it, it, it doesn't feel like they're as real of people sometimes. And that's kind of funny because it means Harem and the Labyrinth of Another World kind of feels like the people are more real, and some of the interactions are kind of more interesting and genuine, but at the same time, you know, I think I would say Black Summer is still a better show just because it keeps you interested in stuff that keeps happening. And, you know, that's what they did with episode 11 for Black Summoner, and I guess they might be setting up for a season finale in episode 12, whereas Harem in the Labyrinth of Another World doesn't feel like it. If I were to take a guess, Harem is supposed to be a two-core whereas uh, Black Summoner is a one-core um, first season. And it's possible there may be a break in ha Harem in the Labyrinth, but if there is, then there's a big weakness there because um, I'm not sure that it would necessarily be that hard for people to get detached and lose some interest in it, per se. But at the same time, you know, it's interesting to compare and contrast those two um, just because they're at the same episode counts. See, next up I have a Parallel World Pharmacy, Episode 9, which dealt with a lot of that stuff. Okay. Um, and good stuff. Um, I feel like the conflict in here is still one where a whole lot of the conflict is not not exactly fake, but it, it doesn't feel as conflicty as I think it should be. Neat things are still happening, though, so it's all good. And, of course, more episodes have come out. This is just how far the dub is. But, yeah. I guess they're setting up for something kind of big and different to show up, and it'd be kind of curious. But I think it falls under the category of being slightly more of a feel-good anime than maybe it really could have been just because it did other stuff that could make it I don't know, they could have made the conflict more notable um, but it is what it is uh, let's see, Uncle from Another World, episode 7 it was all that stuff, and I don't see another one listed, so I'm wondering if that one's taking a break as well, I'm probably going to have to look it up to see what kind of expectations are for that series, but otherwise, you know, it was still a fun little episode, still doing stuff. I think it does kind of suggest a build-up in the storytelling, at least, a kind of curiosity of where the characters go from the information they learned there. Nothing that's, like, so serious that you have to take this series serious or anything like that, but just one of those things where it's like, Okay, well, I do want to see where the story does unfold from there. And this is really the story being told of um, the uncle's time in the isekai, but he's telling him to, again, our modern characters. Uh, that interaction with that character was actually pretty funny. They didn't. They introduced two new characters. I forgot about the other one. Now, whether or not they're planning to do a whole lot with them, I'm not sure. One of them seemed like a potentially one-off joke. Um, they could have things that they're still planning to do with it. The other one, um, I'm definitely quite curious about that. It's also possible they only introduce other characters because they're at the point where they were at a point where it just it made sense to have other characters and maybe they're not planning to do much with them. But I'm curious. I guess you could say that the cast all grew in that episode in a couple different ways. Uh, let's see. Uh, and now for other new stuff. So I finished Rising of the Shield Hero Season 2. That's episodes 9 through 13. And, yeah, I think last week I was talking about how Shield Hero Season 2 just seems weak. And 
I feel like it was the same thing with these. And part of the reason why, like I mentioned last week, there's this general feeling here in Season 2 of it just assumes certain things can be done, but it feels like it's kind of violating its own rules without giving you any real good feeling for, oh yes, those rules should be violatable. It's just sort of like um, if you had to walk um, across town in order to visit your favorite restaurant, but then you find out that there's some smart guy who can just make it where you instantly teleport there. Isn't the real question then, okay, well, how can he make you teleport there? Why should I believe that there's somebody there? The, this show seems to say, oh, well, he's just really smart and he's researched this stuff, but that feels kind of like a cop-out. And I think there's also some material being walked through a little bit faster here than season one did. And it could be the combination of those two things, because the slightly faster speed just kind of makes it feel like things just keep happening, things just keep happening. And I don't think that works out so well, because um, season one worked out in a way because it really threw our main character up shit creek without a paddle, but it still gave him autonomy, goals he had to reach within that and events that happen slightly outside of his control and micro elements, but for the most part, he kind of felt like our main character was self autonomous, and season one's interestingness is kind of the challenges to that, and the unfairness there, you know, the, the season one gets you really angry, but it takes that anger and allows you to kind of see things move forward. So it's like. It. it I think it works because, um, again, our characters, it feels like our characters are driving their story a whole lot more. And season two's completely lost that, and so there's these arbitrary breakages of rules that we maybe didn't know existed, but at the same time they were introduced in relation to other things, so that we, the audience, come out of those with certain expectations, and I feel like season two wasn't delivering on explaining those, and at the same time, our main characters are just, it just feels like they're being pulled around by the plot. It doesn't feel like they have their own autonomy, per se, and it's always a weak thing to do in any kind of storytelling medium. It's a problem that some people talk about with movies nowadays, where it's like, oh, you can't talk bad things about this, but why? Because there's nothing good about the story. You just had a character that just was there, and they were pulled from... In fact, I think, um... Well, I haven't watched the new Pinocchio. I, I kind of get the impression that's one of the main problems with that one. And it's an interesting aside, because the old Pokemon um, Disney movie, you know, the, the old classic animation, the entire point of that one was Pinocchio is a doll made alive who wants to become a real boy, but... In order to become a real boy, he kind of has to be a good boy, so to speak. And the point is, there are temptations that he doesn't quite know how to handle. This is only through failing to handle them that he, you know, he succumbs to temptation a whole lot. His own little, oh yes, I got distracted by this. Oh yes, I decided to do this. Peer pressure, peer pressure, um, uh, schemers, etc. You know, he... he got led along. But in the new movie, it sounded like they changed that so that he just ended up getting pulled along. Even though they're doing the same scenes and the same beats, somehow they completely remove the thing that makes the entire point of the movie anything there. And then it's... And, you know, that's just an example of, oh, yeah... Lots of people have trouble doing that, and I'm not surprised that the people at Disney don't know that, because a lot of these live-action or CGI remakes um, kind of suffer from the same problems where they... <sighs> yeah. Anyways, um, so Rising of the Shield Hero Season 2. I'd probably watch Season 3 if it came out. Maybe it's already out and I haven't noticed. But yeah, I can definitely see. If anybody t 
told me that they also just couldn't continue watching season two. I can completely agree because um, neat characters, neat events aside, it's just as a storytelling mechanism has lost everything that I felt made this first season have real drive and interest. And then um, I started watching Zombieland Saga Season 2. I've watched the first two episodes. I rewatched the first two episodes of the first season because I remember it beginning really funny and I'm like, oh yes. And then you kind of want to watch Episode 2 after watching Episode 1. So it's it's a really good um, introduction to it, I think. And so far, Season 2... Like, I didn't remember the exact ending of Season 1, but I think Season 2 kind of reintroduced kind of where they were and what problems they were dealing with having ended the first season. And, um... I guess I'd say season two is so far off to an okay start. It's the kind of thing where if you're already into it, I think you can continue watching season two. It's definitely not the gut-bustingly funny first episode that um, Zombieland Saga season one had. Um... And in some regards, that could be both a good or bad thing. Um, in my case, it, it's definitely kind of a weakness. Because, I think I've mentioned this before, but since I haven't watched any idol anime in a long time, I'm not really into the concept of idols. Like anybody else's, that's fine. But to me, it's... I don't know. It's, it's kind of the one aspect of celebrity culture that I care the least about, which is um, a kind of idol worship. You know, to me... A celebrity is just another person, and, you know, if you want to say, oh, yes, but this person is beautiful, and I wish I could go on a date with them, I don't really think that way, because I don't know them, and so I don't actually put them in my monkey sphere, but that doesn't necessarily mean they're not in the monkey sphere, because I think these shared celebrity moments are kind of how a lot of us humans in this bigger than a monkey sphere society managed to interact with each other. So like if I went somewhere and you know, I met somebody I never met from before, maybe they're from a different culture, they barely speak English or I barely speak Spanish. I, d I don't speak very good Spanish. Solamente puedo hablar muy pequeño español. Muy poquito. Yeah, see, that that's if if you can speak Spanish, you can kind of tell. Oh, well, I guess those are Spanish words. But I think you can tell I'm not there. So the point is, you know, you could have this. We could be meeting in a country that neither of us are from. And there's a good chance that, you know, there's some movie out there or some famous actor. It's like, oh, Arnold Schwarzenegger. Yeah. Or something like that. Sorry for my strange accent. I don't even know what accent that was supposed to be. Yeah, maybe it was supposed to be some sort of Asian accent. I don't know. But, you know, the point is, you'll, there can be a connection happens because those two people like that. And you see a lot of this in um, culture in general and entertainment in general where two people are like, oh, yeah, we both went to the same um, sorority or whatever in college. And so they kind of feel kinship because of that. Or they're both fans of the same football team. And so they can kind of connect to that. And... There's a lot of little tricks like that, um, just throughout human society in general. And I think, to a certain degree, that's good. But at the same time, it's it also just means that some of those things you just don't connect with other people. And so somebody came up to me and said, oh, hey, I'm a big Houston Oilers fan. I'm like, oh. And in my brain, because I misspell and twist words, it's where dad jokes come from. I think of Euler, the mathematician, and not the Houston one Oilers, even though I know that I'm thinking of the Houston Oilers. So, you know, the brain goes both ways, and I would be tempted to go in that dad joke direction and make a, a you, an Oilers formula or identity or joke or something like that, even though that wouldn't allow us to connect. But the point would be, for me, even if I put all that aside, I would say, huh, yeah, well, there's no football team I'm particularly into. So how have the Houston Oilers been doing? Hopefully you've been getting satisfying watches from those. So instead, I guess I kind of connect with people on a weird meta level. The, the way you're supposed to, if, um, you're spo if you're trying to practice doing small talks. This has been an interesting... Um, okay, yeah, I was talking about the last thing on the list there. <laughs> oh, well. 
lots of funny stuff. And again, I'm not a big fan of the concept of idols, as in like the fact that they would go on stage and dance and sing. It's not anything special to me. So that usually makes a lot of shows which are about characters that want to become idols um, a little bit meaningless to me. A little bit. I mean, and meaningless is a strong word, but it does mean that usually the show has to find something else to hook me. And Zombieland Saga is a good example of one of those shows that does, because it's a wild premise, it goes wild with the idea, and it's generally fun. And these first two episodes, episode one was that, I kind of, I would say episode one was a little weak insofar as it's, it needs to be a transition from season one into season two. I would say it's better than something like Stranger Things Season 2, but um, Season 2, Episode 2, I guess was an interesting side thing. And again, it doesn't come down to, oh yes, these characters being idols. It comes down to, okay, these characters are more than idols. They are more than just trying to be idols. They kind of have complicated dynamics. Episode 1 had some of that too, but um, overall... I, I definitely want to rewatch more of it. If there's anything that came out today, so Vivi or Back Arrow, those are kind of curiosities. Uh, that is a part two, so I must have a part one somewhere. Or if I don't, I'll just watch it on Crunchyroll. But, um, hmm. I don't know. Should be around somewhere. Oh well. But, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll probably continue watching Zombie Land Saga Season 2. It's off to a good start. I'm sure some of y'all are curious about any of my thoughts about Overlord Season 4, or maybe you're not because maybe it's been a bland season and nobody cares. So, my Friday friend has been traveling and I do believe he's back this coming Friday, so I will have a chance to start watching stuff that I've been watching with him um, before. And most likely, since Overlord has been the higher priority of the two anime we're watching, we're going to probably try and catch up on Overlord. Probably? really depends on how much time we spend doing other stuff. He's been traveling, so he may have a lot of travel stuff to talk about. Chances are we're going to eat at um, Troy, a really delicious um, Turkish food restaurant here in um, Austin. If you're in Austin, I think you can look for Troy ATX. You know, really great, and if we go there, there's always some risk that, you know... We meet the um, the owners of the restaurant and just chat with them because we've been dining there for a long time and I don't know I, I I don't know how that stuff happens but you know sometimes you just end up you know and th I think this happened one time before where we didn't even watch anything and we just spent the whole time socializing and that might happen here but we'll have to see. Uh, let's see, other stuff, so my Twitch friend finally watched Stranger Things Season 4 Episodes 8 and 9, and I was re-watching them, of course, and yeah, it's still pretty damn good stuff. So, it's hard not to sing its praises, especially since we're in a field where it's, there's a lot of expensive crap being peddled our way. It's really nice to be able to point at something and say, okay, you know, and there's were some things in there that might be good but the worry is that you know season one was pretty good and then season two and three got progressively worse those elements aren't necessarily gone in season four but they were kept more under control so there's some risk that season five gets them out of control again so it's possible season four may be just one magical awesome season before stranger things just peters out and also finishes in things up with season five whenever that happens um if i were to take a, an example now it's, it's just one of those things where it's like okay they've clearly set certain things to happen in season five if they do then i'm worried because there's a huge chance that they prioritize the wrong things let me go ahead and talk about priorities because i did have this thought where um, season 4 does have this plot of um, Robin having a love interest and I talked about it before and it works out in season 4 because 
it doesn't disrupt the main story and it isn't something that necessarily needs to be resolved but it the, they could just have it in there and they made it where it's not so intrusive that its presence is there. Instead, it's just a good thread for our characters to interact that just gives them, you know, world outside of their stuff and outside of what they're doing for the story. And that works out pretty well. But if you go back to, like, season two and you have Max and her brother, you know, that was another thing where, okay, well, our man one of our new characters, Max, has this relationship with her brother, and that was too disruptive to the story. It, it had no bearing relevance other than just as a distraction in order for the new character they introduced to have something they had to resolve. And that was a problem. It was a distraction. So you can see that element's still present. It's kept under really good control in Season 4. And I guess I'm worried about Season 5 just, you know, losing control of that sort of stuff so we'll have to see because the other element that makes season five potentially really good season one ended in a way that if stranger things was only one season it would have been a good story from suburb america 1980 something you know so a, a little one-off story it would have been okay with that but season two had to follow up and it kind of knew some of the stuff it was going to play with, but it narratively, um, it had to kind of start threads that it didn't want to leave dangling from the first one that weren't really set up for a continued season per se. And season four does this one big thing differently than season one in terms of setting up a for a particularly great start to season five you know at this point everybody's excited for season five because season four tells you shit's real yo let's go to season five now which of course season five isn't out yet so i don't know mix we'll have to see what happens when it comes out uh and i don't have it in my notes here. You know, I keep looking at my notes, but my notes don't talk about non-anime stuff, so y'all get whatever. Um, there is... Um, okay, yeah, da-da-da-da. My brain is going the wrong direction. Rick and Morty, because um, I did mention Season 6, Episode 1 back when I watched it. I did watch Season 6, Episode 2 before last week's episode. I just forgot to talk about it. Um... And here I am, I've watched season six episodes two and three. And it's actually, I'd say it's a pretty fun season so far. Um, I look at season six episode two as an excuse to have our main character, sorry, our main voice actor, I forget his name, have Morty talking to a lot of other Mortys. And they aren't just Mortys, they're different people that are it's hard to explain if you watch it you'd understand and in a lot of ways it's just kind of amusing just because it is doing that and there's this other very fun and entertaining i i call it the b story i guess but it's it's more like an a.5 it's really close to a story they're joined at the hips they're not too distinct from each other even though in some ways they are and I'd say it's a, just a fun episode. Really good job. Um, what can I think about episode three here, though? I wouldn't say it's as fun as the uh, simple idea of the f previous one, but it introduces, I guess, some more fun dynamics. I'm not quite sure what I want to say or don't want to say. Because I don't know who's watched what and what would be spoiler or not spoiler. Um, but I guess it's nice because it's a little more exploratory of the Smith family. In a way that isn't like intrusively exploratory. It's just one where it's... Um, I don't know, just kind of spending time with them. It feels like there aren't a lot of times and it isn't this big epic complex thing and it's a kind of an amusing different um thing 
and I guess they kind of have something in there that's similar to some of their improv ideas, but not exactly improv stuff. So I don't think it's supposed to be their improv episode if they're having one this season. But it is definitely something that's reminiscent of some of the things that are amusing about that. Um, where, like, you have this... Uh, yeah, I don't know what I want to say. I, I guess it was just fun. I, so far, I kind of like season six. I like that it's not making everything out to have to become this big, over-the-top thing every single time. Even some of the things I felt like they easily could be, I felt like it kept it at just the right level where... It wasn't building up to be crazy. It was just exploring these silly ideas. And I think uh, Rick and Morty's kind of been very strong when it's things like that. And probably the most impressive thing about Episode 2 is um, it revisited a previous idea that was a little bit of a one-off gag, kind of, that people have always remembered and referenced. But, you know, it made it into a kind of central plot point of this episode without... Um, Yeah. You know, w without feeling like it had no purpose or place. It definitely was just doing something fun with it that was something different for the series. So, good praises for them so far. You know, maybe some of you liked the over-the-top stuff that Rick and Morty used to do in the previous couple seasons, I think. But if you're a fan of, oh no, it's just doing the simple thing, I kind of feel like it's been fun so far. Hopefully it stays fun. Alright, anything else? Video games, uh, Splatoon 3, Splatfest. I've chosen my team. I'm going to be on Team Gear. Um, you know, I, I don't answer it from a... Um, who, which team do I think I want to be a part of? I, I kind of am a huge nerd in terms of just answering the question. Maybe nerd's not the right word. But, you know, the question is, what do I want on, this, on a deserted island? You know, as fun as food and games would be, although they're grubbing games, although it's grubbing food, but it should obviously be gear grub games. Anyways, as fun as those are, I kind of prefer the idea of tools or gear just because, in theory, that means that you don't have to deal with the possibility of maybe your food running out. So, like, if you're on a deserted island and you have food, you know, if you're just there to visit then yeah, sure, bring food or games. Nothing wrong with that. But if you're talking about, if you happen to be trapped on there, I'd be worried about having um, a pre-delivered supply of food because, you know, maybe that's a good start, and that would probably be a second choice for me, but I would be worried about long-term whether or not I'd be able to continue feeding myself or giving myself adequate um, refreshments or something like that. Um, games, of course, just falls on the wayside because while playing games would be something you could do and maybe you could have enough of them such that you wouldn't get bored the truth of the matter is if you're on a deserted island you need to make sure you have enough um, food and drink you need to survive whatever weather catastrophes may come up and that just leaves the practical team gear where to some degree I kind of feel like if you started with appropriate gear you'd probably be more likely to have um, food, shelter, water and when it comes to entertaining yourself, you know, you wouldn't have your video game consoles or board games or anything like that. But I kind of feel like living the day-to-day -day life where you're having to take care of the various things in order to um, survive day-to-day -day tends to be something that keeps you a lot more engaged and entertained. And I'm obviously getting old enough where I can also appreciate just being given a chance to mentally shut down and stuff like that. So. Those thoughts there. But I haven't been doing much in Splatoon 3 otherwise. Um, I want to spend more time. But tiring things. My brother's playing with uh, making his own pizza. The dough tasted pretty good, and I think that's kind of the hard first start. Now, getting it where it's in the shapes he wants, or it doing certain things he wants, you know, it seems to be something he still needs to play with. Like his second one puffed up a lot, and I would have liked to eat some of that really puffed up pizza. But, um, I didn't. He didn't have enough cheese. Okay, fine. Sometimes you don't have enough ingredients. I think the sauce can be tweaked a little bit, but it wasn't bad what was there. And I really enjoyed the slices I did eat, and I could have eaten the entire pizza myself, because it was still pizza. 
but you know that that's I guess the important thing about that is if you're wondering why I'm exhausted part of the reason is like my Saturday was dedicated to making sure that happened so I didn't play a whole lot of Dead by Daylight or Splatoon 3 and in VRChat I'm definitely doing some tweaks to my avatar to try and get something working I think I have to figure out why that thing behaves that way. Interesting. Maybe I didn't copy something correctly. I should probably play around with it in a standalone avatar. But that's a different thought. Anyways, um, and I think that's everything I was going to blabber about here. Y'all, have a nice week.